I have this wonderful um, opportunity uh, on a, several occasions to channel Chuck. He's, uh, he's a real visionary leader. I'm shorter than he is and a little heavier, but I, I do my best. And uh, recently at CLEAR, um, I led a retreat of the staff and the board together. So it, it's sort of part of this, part of what Jeff was talking about, bringing everybody in the room at the same time to have a conversation. And CLEAR essentially in the last two months has reoriented itself in the ways that I think that this symposium is moving. So let me, let me just read this very short new mission statement. You are among the first people hearing it. Um, CLEAR aspires to transform the information landscape to support the advancement of knowledge. Its mission is it's an independent nonprofit organization that forges strategies to enhance research, teaching, and learning environments in collaboration, the word we've used already today, with libraries, cultural institutions, and communities of higher learning. And the last part of it, which I think will be useful for us today, CLEAR promotes collaborative solutions that transcend disciplinary, institutional, professional, and geographic boundaries in support of the public good. In pursuing its mission, CLEAR is committed to building trust, retaining independence, fostering collaboration, cultivating effective leadership, and remaining agile. I think this is a, a mission for CLEAR, but it's probably a mission for all of us in the academic library world, and I hope today we'll be um, we'll have some really good conversations about these issues. Um, as a historian, I also want to say that I think we're in a very interesting moment that reminds me of the middle, the, the early to middle 19th century when all of us in the room were faculty, were students, were librarians together. Um, when the silos that we've developed as librarianship professionalized, as academic learning professionalized, as the disciplines hardened, uh, into hard boundaries, those things are starting to break down, I think, in very useful ways. And the other issue, I think, that makes it different from the early 19th century, I think we felt that we could control information, that it was something that we could describe and corral and tame and put in a certain set of boxes. I think those boxes have, have opened up, and I think it's, it's scary right now to be in the profession we're in, but it's also quite exciting. So um, hopefully today we will, um, we will look at the fear and look at the excitement and see where we can go from here. Our first speaker is going to be Kate Wittenberg. She's going to talk about faculty. Faculty and surveys. And, and Joan is going to talk about students. And one last thing, Jeff talked about bringing us all together here. It's so nice to have faculty, students, staff, librarians together in one room. And let's try to think about while both of these folks are speaking about how we are faculty and students together and how we are staff together, how we're all learning together and how we're all teaching together. So Kate. with librarians for many years and I've always felt and said that I think that librarians are well ahead of many others in our community in their innovative thinking uh, and their effective collaboration in moving forward in this whole area. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to bring our perspective and some of our findings to this conference. Um, I'm reporting on results from a survey conducted by two of my colleagues, uh, Roger Schoenfeld and Ross Housewright. Roger is the director of the research group, um, where I'm doing the consulting group at Ithaca SNR, 
And um, Rogers was going to come and speak with me, but his wife is literally due to have a baby, I think, as we speak, and so he felt it would not be prudent to get on a plane for Toronto, and I completely agree. But um, I will do my best to summarize a very deep and detailed survey. The whole survey, uh, both the library and the faculty surveys, are available on the Ithaca website, and I'll have uh, information about how to get to that at the end of the presentation. So just a word about what Ithaca and Ithaca SNR uh, is. The strategy and research group um, looks at large issues in having to do with the transformation of scholarship and teaching in the online environment. And we try to identify critical issues and then particularly in the consulting group actually help various organizations and um, scholarly scholars and faculty and libraries figure out effective ways to move forward during this transformative period. Um, we are part of an umbrella group, which is Ithaca as a whole, which also includes JSTOR, the research platform, and Portico, the digital preservation service. The areas that we work in, in the research and consulting group, just to put this in context, include five strands, as we call them. And we're trying in, in all of our work to look at each of these areas and particularly look at the ways that they're connected um, for the members of the community. We're looking at attitudes and practices of faculty and students, and this is where the survey of faculty <coughs> falls squarely in that strand. We're looking at the role of the library, clearly relevant to this meeting. We're also looking at scholarly publishing, publishing writ large, including all forms of publishing, print, digital, journals, monographs, and new forms of publishing, whatever they may be. We're looking at the sustainability of all of these kinds of projects over the long term. And we're looking at teaching and learning with technology. The framing questions for the surveys that I'm going to summarize um, are the following. What roles do library users prioritize for their libraries? How do these user perspectives match with the library's own strategic priorities as they're stated by library uh, leaders? And how do libraries' actual activities align with their users' needs and their own strategic priorities? So these were the large framing questions for the survey. The faculty survey is something that the research group has done for many years, since 2000, done every three years. The uh, most recent one, the, the one that I'm reporting on is the 2009 survey. They looked at U.S. faculty members at higher ed institutions. They mailed 35,000 surveys in 2009. Um, they received 3,000 completed responses for an eight, approximately 8.6% 8 response rate. Um, and this rate is consistent over time with the previous survey, so no big surprises <laughs> there. And um, we want to say that although this is representative in many ways of a broad universe of faculty and their perceptions, but um, it's not a large enough survey to conclude anything absolute, but should instead be used to build hypotheses and look at these large framing questions and move us forward in our thinking. The first m question had to do with how important is it to you that your college or university library provides each of the functions. First function is as a gateway, as a starting point for locating your information. Second as an archive, and we define that as a repository of resources. And third as a buyer, paying for the resources that you need for either from journals, books, or electronic databases. What we found is that the buyer role is now highest in importance in the eyes of faculty. The gateway role has continued to decline in perceived importance. Now this may be intuitive given the role of the network and internet search engines and other sorts of ways of finding your way to information. Um, but it's interesting to see faculty say this. And second, significantly more humanists value the gateway role than do other disciplines. 
However, these, even the humanist attitudes are starting to trend in this same direction as the sciences. Second, how important is it to you that your college or university library provides each of the functions below? Um, and they, in this case, we included teaching support and research support in addition to the gateway archive and buyer roles. Here we found research and teaching support roles don't challenge the library's role as a buyer, at least in the view of the faculty we surveyed. Um, and we think that over time we'll be better able to evaluate if these roles are growing or declining. Obviously we're going to continue doing this survey and we don't have the next um, iteration of it, but when we do, this seems to be a time when we're seeing a movement and it will be very interesting to see if it continues in this direction or not. And, this, and both, both teaching and research support are substantially less valued in the sciences. Again, this might be intuitive to those of you who work with scholars in all of these fields, but um, this was definitely borne out by the survey. The next question had to do with your starting point for your research. We asked faculty, when you are conducting academic research, which of these four starting points do you use to begin locating information? This is a start, not when you get further into it. <laughs> Choices were the library, physical library building, the online library catalog, a general purpose search engine, and a specific electronic research resource or database. Now here we have the results of 2003, 2006, and 2009 shown together. And what we see is that faculty continue to grow more and more reliant on the network level discovery services. There are notable disciplinary differences. <clears throat> Humanists are relatively more dependent on local discovery services. But attitudes in all sectors, even the humanities, again, are moving in the same direction. Now, we also recently completed a survey of librarians. Um, in this case, we looked at library directors, or in some cases, their immediate deputies. Um, at baccalaureate, masters, and doctoral colleges in the, or universities in the US. Um, we did not include responses from people in non-leadership positions um, or from camp, branch campus libraries, medical or law, for example. And this is not because we don't, didn't think that these perspectives were interesting. It was simply that they were out of the scope of this particular survey, and we wanted to look at the, the views of these topics from the leadership perspective. Um, community colleges were excluded from the population because we felt they face a different set of issues and, and deserve a separate set of survey questions. We sent out 2,400 invitations and got an 11 percent response rate to this survey. The role of the library, the comparison um, with faculty, we asked how important to you is it that your college or university library provide each of the functions below? <coughs> Teaching, facilitator, uh, and you'll see again these are library directors on the bottom and faculty members on top. Undergraduate information literacy teacher. Um, research supporter. Uh, buyer. Archive and gateway. Um, and you'll see clearly the teaching facilitator, there's the, the biggest difference here um, between what the library directors and the faculty members said, um, this is clearly an interesting point to take up later, and it's one of the strategic questions I'm going to list at the end. The library's highest priority strategic roles seem to be relatively low on faculty members' lists of priorities for the library. Some of these roles are directed at students. And one of the questions I think will be very interesting for all of us to discuss here and, and going into the future is can the library succeed in these student-facing roles with very mixed levels of support from the faculty? How does that faculty support role affect or not affect what a library does strategically? And second, 
How can the library increase the vil visibility and value to faculty of these strategically important roles? That is, how do you get buy-in or even communicate better communication channels with faculty about what you're trying to do? Second question had to do with library spending priorities. And we asked, if you received a 10% increase in your library's budget next year, in addition to the funds you already expected, in which of the following areas would you allocate the money? And the answers were, in this descending order, online or digital journals, tools for discovery, staff for reference and user <coughs> services, teaching and research support included there, facilities, expansions and renovations, other digital resources, electronic versions of monographs, or staff in management administration of digital resources? Now, there are a lot of questions raised by this, but I'm just pulling out a couple um, to highlight. Spending priorities seem to prioritize the acquisition of new content. This is clearly a top priority role for faculty but relatively low on libraries' list of strategic priorities. And there could be many reasons for this. It could be the way that libraries talk about their priorities and assume that one thing will be done no matter what and then focus on new activities. It's not clear, but this was clearly a, an interesting um, point to, to look at. Do library prioritization of new content reflect faculty preferences or the library's strategy? And is this content acquisition an underlying support for other roles that are, in fact, higher strategic priorities? Second, spending priorities emphasize discovery, although it's not a stop, top strategic priority for either the library directors or for faculty members. So what strategic priorities does the pursuit of these discovery roles support? Does an emphasis on discovery reflect perceived student needs? And where's that perception coming from at various libraries? And can the library effectively take on a discovery role that will be highly valued by its users? <coughs> Again, these are not the only questions to look at, but these are things that we thought were particularly important um, for spurring further discussion. Again, the full survey of the 2010 faculty survey is on our site. The, um, the, sorry, the library survey from 2010 is available now. The faculty survey is from all years, but particularly the one I talked about, 2009, is available um, on our site. And again, we'll be continuing um, looking at faculty. We're starting to plan the next survey already and would be very interested in your thoughts about what other kinds of surveys would be useful and also what other kinds of questions you think might have been missing or should be enhanced or changed as we go forward with the next round of research studies. Thank you. Good morning. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me, and welcome to uh, all of you to this really interesting program. Uh, I'm going to talk about students, and uh, my presentation is really in two parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about what do we know about students, and the second part is going to be about what I believe some of this data is telling us about the future role uh, and environment of academic libraries vis-a-vis uh, -vis students. So some of the things that uh, I'll be covering are data from a wide variety of reports that look at things like uh, students' information skills, their technology skills, the uses of their uses of mobile technologies, I also believe that it's important that we understand attitudes and perceptions and not just um, actual use or uh, ownership of uh, technology devices or things like that. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the second half will be in what, what are the implications for academic libraries of the future. This presentation started as a result of a blog post um, from Jeff's blog in which he mentioned that he had read one of the 
studies uh, produced by Allison Head and Mike Eisenberg. And Mike Eisenberg is a former dean and current faculty member at the I School at University of Washington in Seattle. And Allison Head is an affiliated researcher with uh, you know, UW. And they have published um, several reports, I believe it's at least three at this point, um, as part of what they call their project information literacy. And I'm drawing my um, data for this um, talk from one of the studies because it's um, much more oriented to use of information in academic work. One of their more recent reports talks about college students' use of information in their everyday life. And I'm m personally much more interested in the academic uh, link between information and students than I am about the social kinds of um, or personal kinds of information needs. So let's start with some good news. In the, they surveyed students in six institutions of various sizes, and some public and private, and some private, and nearly all students that they surveyed use scholarly databases in course-related research. So I know that many librarians are concerned that they're spending a lot of money on databases and they want to make sure that students use appropriate sources in their research and in fact the students are using them. However, there's some caveats. Al almost all students rely on the same few information resources regardless of context. So in my earlier career when I was a, a librarian. I was a librarian at four different academic institutions, always in public services, and I started uh, information literacy programs at uh, Georgetown University, and I created an online uh, searching program for users at Cornell in the early 1980s when hardly anyone was doing that. So I'm very familiar with um, how students approach information and how we've been teaching them about looking for information. Um, and one of the principles that we always thought about uh, when we were doing instruction was that what students would learn in one course or in one field, they would be able to apply in other contexts. And what this data is saying is they're not doing that. They're using the same um, information resources, databases, whether or not they're appropriate, to a, a course in another discipline. And I see some of you nodding your heads, and I've heard this anecdotally uh, from many librarians. Now, while, many, uh, while most of the students use the scholarly databases, their go-to resource was Google. So, uh, I think that one of the really, really important things for librarians to understand is that it is not just the students who are starting with Google, but as Kate said, more and more faculty are starting with Google. So they don't have a role model of faculty saying, go to this database first, or go to the library website or the catalog first. Many of their role models in their courses, namely their faculty, are starting with Google too. And students, when they begin their research, rather than going through the typical search strategy process that many librarians advise in their information literacy classes, students often start with something that I don't believe is on the radar of most information literacy librarians, and that is that they start with their course readings. And actually, it makes a lot of sense that they do that because they know these are sources that are vetted by their faculty member, and it's a great way to get background information. And it's a point that is skipped, and I would contend that I believe it's skipped in information literacy sessions because often the librarian is actually not all that connected into the course and has no idea what the course readings are and just doesn't occur to him or her to suggest to the students that they start there. So I think this is an, a useful part of information for librarians to, to realize. And basically, they sum up some of their findings by saying the librarian approach is one based on thoroughness, the student approach is based on efficiency. 
They've got an assignment. They want to get it done. They want to please their faculty member, and they take the approach that they think will work. Uh, I'm a big fan of the OCLC research studies, and they have a new study that is uh, on perceptions. Um, many of you have probably read this, the one that they put out maybe in 2005 or so, and then they broke out a separate report on college student perceptions. In this new report, there are, if you haven't seen it yet, it's freely available on their website as a download. And uh, they have, I don't know, maybe about 10 pages that are uh, where they uh, segment out the data just for college students. And they uh, point out that 83% of college students begin their information searches with search engines. They also show some very high statistics for use of scholarly databases, just as the head Eisenberg study did. But the databases and the library websites in particular are not seen as starting points. It is quite remarkable that literally zero of the respondents to their survey said they began their information search with a library website. And the top reasons that students gave is that other websites have better information. Now, I, I don't know um, what that means to students. Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to understand that better? And that's where I encourage you to talk to your students and find out if they concur and what that exactly means so that you can work on developing a presence that is more meaningful to your students. This is one of my favorite statistics. The Educause Center for Applied Research has been doing an annual study of undergraduate students in technology, looking at a broad range of universities. And this does include students in all age groups, so not just our typical 18 to 22-year-old students. 80% of students rated themselves as very skilled or expert in efficiently and effectively searching the web, okay? So if they come into your information literacy classes and they think they're expert or very skilled in searching, do you think they're gonna listen carefully if you get up in front of the class and say, I'm going to teach you to search? They already know how to search in their view. And I think that it's also interesting to note that fewer than half rated themselves with those same uh, very skilled or expert in understanding ethical and legal issues related to digital information. These are also things that we believe as librarians are very important for students to understand in today's environment. So perhaps starting a discussion in an information uh, literacy question with a genuine discussion involving the students, maybe posing a, a problem and asking their views on intellectual property or privacy or those kinds of things might actually stimulate engagement in understanding some issues dealing with information and then moving on to other topics. I also recommend to you a study by Esther Hargitay and some of her colleagues at Northwestern University. This was published in a journal in uh, 2010. And she focused on, um, in, in terms of students seeking information, <coughs> excuse me, their perception, their attitude. And again, I think this is just as important that of the numbers of use. It's how they think about these things. For college students, I'm quoting, brands play an integral role in information-seeking activities. That is, name brand recognition is a key component of credibility perception. So it's one of the ways and a key way that they evaluate resources. And Google and Google Scholar and others, you could name them, I'm sure, some of the brands that many college students know, they use those because they believe the brand equates credibility. They also can be discriminating in ways that they may not be given credit for. For example, their study showed that students trust information from .edu and .gov websites more than from commercial sites. So I do believe students discriminate 
in their use of information resources in many cases. But she sums up a point that I was making about the information from the ECAR study about how we approach students when we're trying to teach them or interact with them um, in, uh, in information contacts. They suggest that any inf intervention, meaning instruction or a one-on-one -on -one, uh, reference interview, hoping to educate people about the assessment of online credibility must start by recognizing the level of trust that certain search engines and brand names garner from some users and address this in a way that is fruitful to a critical overall evaluation of online materials. Now, personally, I translate this into if a librarian starts a session, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one interview or a class with don't trust Google or don't use Google, and they think that's the brand with credibility, it's again one way that you might be tuned out at the outset rather than having a discussion and putting it in a context and moving on from there. I, I am. I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you should stand in front of the class and say, just Google. <laughs> I'm out of here. Have fun. Go, go do your work. That's not what I'm suggesting. But what I'm suggesting is that you understand the mindset of the students that you're dealing with so that you can develop appropriate strategies for instruction and for expanding that mindset. Now, I could have uh, brought in a lot of uh, statistics about students' use of technology, but instead I'm going to uh, just highlight very briefly three things that I think are uh, significant. One is that ownership of internet-capable handheld devices is increasing rapidly. So I believe this is one of the key issues for the future of academic libraries, that more and more students and faculty will be accessing and reading and creating information on handheld devices. And as uh, plans change for uh, mobile services and, lim and limitless use or more generous use at lower prices becomes available, I believe this will explode. The second point is that daily use of learning management systems is increasing. So if students are present, if the learning management system is where they get a lot of information about their courses, I think it's a great place for libraries to have a presence. If they want to interact with students and suggest resources and have chats or have a presence, the course management system, I believe, is going to become even more important than it already is for many students. And the third is that while in earlier years of the ECAR study, there was a notable age difference in students who were heavy users of social networking versus older students who were lighter users, the age gap is lessening. And so we need to think about uh, more ubiquitous use of social networking kinds of resources. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on the mobile environment. Now, we are preparing for the future, and as we look to the future, we ought to realize that the iPhone is becoming the toddler's favorite toy, as reported in this story in the New York Times. And one of the things that is fascinating is that uh, Stu uh, young children who can't even read yet are able to manipulate icons on an iPhone and find things like a story that might be read aloud to them or a little game that they can play or photos of their grandmother uh, and grandfather that they can look at and they can interact with this information device from the youngest age. And I believe that more and more they will have these kinds of devices, whether it's a smartphone or an iPad type device, as their primary device. That is supported by a study of both US and UK uh, teenagers in which they were asked if they had to give up all but one device, and they listed uh, a number of devices, including a game console, which would you keep? And both US and UK kids chose the mobile phone. Okay, that's theirs. It's very personal. They want it, they can do 
They can watch television, they can listen to music, they can text their friends, they can call people, and increasingly, if they have a smartphone, they're going to be able to surf the internet, and they'll use it for social networking sites as well. A small study at Stanford University by a Stanford professor demonstrated that a third of Stanford students are uh, worried that they use their iPhone too much. But 75% said that iPhone made them happier. <laughs> but here's the, the aspect of this that I think is um, important for libraries. The researcher said it was not so much with the object itself, meaning the, the iPhone, but it had so much personal information that it became a kind of extension of the mind and a means to have a social life. It just kind of captured part of their identity. So right now, I think most students and uh, faculty use iPhones or similar devices more in their social and family lives. But I believe increasingly they will use this as a personal information device including their academic information, and we need to be ready for that. So students use a lot of technology, but what are their perceptions of using technology in their disciplinary and professional lives? And less than half in uh, the ECAR study said that their instructors provide adequate training for IT, and uh, less than half agree or strongly agree that by the time they graduate, the IT they have used in courses will have adequately prepared them for the workplace, and an additional 38% were neutral. Now, I haven't seen any statistics that might substitute library or information resources, and I think that would be very interesting. Do students feel that they're prepared to use the information resources in their disciplines for their professional lives? And that would be a good question to answer. Now, in a different study done by a commercial outfit called CDW, uh, they showed that the students uh, do feel that they are being prepared to use technology as a business or professional tool. So I don't know if it was the difference in the sample in the universities that they studied or whatever, but it does demonstrate that we don't always, we can't always uh, completely trust uh, the statistics. Um, on the affective side, I also think it's important to understand that um, in this study called the Library Study at Fresno State in California, students find research and writing assignments to be a serious source of stress and users experience a disjuncture between their expectations that the library and university reality is as puzzling and disappointing, and often they feel poorly served. So they're, they're feeling lost, they're feeling uh, that they can't accomplish their, their goals of getting their assignments done easily. This is also a really fascinating study using anthropological methods. It's done by a faculty member and some uh, grad students and students at uh, this university. So to summarize, what do we know about students? Students and librarians often have different perceptions of the value of information resources and information-seeking strategies. Students do have their own perceptions of what they know and what they don't know, and students want to be able to use dis discipline-specific technologies in their future work. I'm going to move on uh, and pick up the pace a little bit to how can the academic library of the future better serve students. For a number of years, I've been talking about the need for libraries to make digital content more visible. Libraries have always made their content visible through books on the shelf, and I mean that seriously. That's the OCLC perceptions, the earlier study, the brand of libraries, books, 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 and we showed everybody the books. Now we need to show them the digital information. And this was an interesting idea uh, from this Fresno State study that uh, he, they suggested that the um, libraries should explore a social bookmarking system, and those things do exist for catalogs, uh, for tagged, uh, for putting tags into the library catalog, and then they could be 
projected in real time on a highly visible wall. The effect would be to make the otherwise esoteric uh, library holdings into a public and demystified process. So this is a screen that's a, it's a different approach, but the one at the Seattle Public Library. And we had a terrific presentation from the folks at Case Western Reserve University Library on some of the public displays they're using in their library. We can also use video walls to display data visualizations, art information like they do at the, the link at Duke and like they're doing at the new media center at McMaster. We can promote our services. These are a number of the signs and displays at NC State University Information Commons. I particularly draw your attention to the one with a lotus flower that says, feeling overwhelmed by your courses, and then talking about library tools. This is right above the reference desk. It's uh, uh, looking at the affective side of uh, engaging students. They also have uh, uh, the, the one on the top left is of all the devices that are available in the library and for checkout. And what's the point of doing all these things if no one knows about it? At Ryerson University in Canada, um, they asked what library services do you currently use on your handheld device? And the top response, almost 60% of students said they were unaware of these services. It's really sad. We can reconceptualize the library's role in the curriculum. One of the most effective ways, I believe, is for faculty to tell other faculty about the library's role. And uh, at P University of Pennsylvania, they have on their website success stories. And at Dartmouth, they also describe the very specific projects that librarians are doing in collaboration and multimedia specialists and instructional technologists with faculty. A new mode of collaboration that I hadn't come across before I saw very recently where the, a Center for Research Libraries librarian is working with a class at Carnegie Mellon University. So a remote relationship in which the uh, Center for Research Library recommended some primary sources for a project and then actually digitized the newspapers for students to use in the course. And it was very successful and students in fact uh, had, did such a good job that some were invited to, uh, had papers presented at a national conference. I also believe we need to be more creative about in, tr genuinely involving students in the development of services. For example, developing library guides as they did once at uh, University of Colorado Health Sciences or in having students do the social uh, media presence of the library. They are paying a student at UC Santa Barbara to be in charge of doing uh, social networking for the library. Developing personal and social services for the mobile environment. Some of you may be familiar with the Wolf Walk, which is a geo-referenced tour of the campus linked to uh, items in their special collections. Really creative. And developing other new ways because no, in, according to this article in Technology Review, mobility is transforming humanity. That's a pretty big statement. It's making us more connected, putting unfathomable resources of data, information, and content at our fingertips. How are we responding to this revolution? We need to develop spaces that promote creation of new information, like media centers that are staffed with people who can assist students and spaces that inspire through art and other mechanisms. We also need to think about how we brand spaces. At the American University of Cairo, they call their quiet area the serenity room. Most of all, we need to engage students in new ways. And if you substitute information or library for Michael's use of technology, I think you'll see that we have to start with things that are real and relevant to students. And then importantly, we need to be part of their community. We need to collaborate with students and faculty to work within the courses, not outside of them as add kind of an, an add-on. We have to make them see technology as essential to learning. And so I would substitute technology and information, collaborating and accomplishing their real goals. 
So in conclusion, my hope is that the academic of the library of the future will encourage deep connections among library staff, faculty, students, curriculum, and content. That the library of the future will develop creative technology applications and services that assist students in the creation of new knowledge, support the development of personal collections of information, particularly in the mobile environment, and incorporate social networking capabilities and connections. And finally, we'll provide environments that inspire, encourage, and facilitate learning. Thank you.